In the last two lectures, we looked at how the discovery of vaccines played a significant role in extending human life expectancy. Today's lecture, we will be looking at another medical breakthrough that helped improve uh, the life expectancies of humans, uh, and it is the discovery of antibiotics. In this lecture, we will learn about the basic biology of bacteria, the history of antibiotic discoveries, as well as the concept of natural selection, which is the key driving force for evolution. Now, understanding the science behind evolution will help us prepare for the next lecture, which uh, is about the emergence of superbug, um, something that is actually creating a serious threat to modern medicine and healthcare. Let's start with bacteria biology. Uh, the picture here shows what's called a gram stain, right? And a gram stain is an easy way to classify bacteria into what's called gram positive, shown here uh, as purple, or they could be classified as gram negative, which is shown here in pink. Knowing whether a bacteria is gram positive or gram negative will actually help the doctor to decide what antibiotics to use um, to treat the infection. And we are gonna talk more about uh, the distinction between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria um, later on. Another way to classify bacteria is based on their shapes. Um, they can be spherical, which we will call them cocci. They could be rod shape, which we will call them bacilli, or they could be spiral in shape as well. And there is no special name for spiral. Spiral is just spiral. Um, cocci, the spherical bacteria, can either grow in chains as shown here. Uh, and if they're growing in chains, then we call them streptococci. Now, you might be familiar with uh, strep throat, which is a type of infection that is caused by a bacteria uh, that's called the group A streptococci. So what that means is they grow in chains. If they grow in clusters, kind of like grapes, um, then we call them staphylococci. So streptococci, for growing in chains and staphylococci for growing in clusters. So there is a type of staphylococci called the MRSA, um, which is a type of superbug that we'll be looking at in the next lecture. We briefly talked about the cell theory in lecture one, which basically states that all living things are made of one or more cells. Uh, and with the understanding of cell theory and later germ theory, um, that has led to a lot of advances in understandings of, of medicine uh, and that paved the way in creating a lot of the medical innovations that we saw. So there are two types of cells in general. The more primitive single cell organism like bacteria, they belong to a group called prokaryotes. Okay, prokaryotes are much simpler uh, in terms of structures and um, compared to, to human cells, which are way more complex. And we classify human cells as eukaryotes. Okay, so prokaryotes are bacteria, eukaryotes are human cells, basically. And here is a picture of each, and you can see there are a lot more stuff going on in the eukaryotic cells than um, compared to the prokaryotic cells. There are fundamental differences between the structures of prokaryotes and eukaryotes, as you can tell from the diagram on the previous slide. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons why antibiotics are so wonderful and so powerful and so effective is that they would selectively kill off all the prokaryotes, all the bacteria, but leave the human cells, the eukaryotic cells, they leave them unharmed. Okay, and that's the desired effect, right? You want to be able to kill off the things that you don't want, which is the bacteria in this case, uh, while leaving your own cells untouched, unharmed. So here are some basic features of a bacteria. Um, so a bacteria is going to have a, 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 what we call a plasma membrane. Uh, and, you know, human cells, we have that too. That's basically the barrier that separates the living uh, uh, content on the inside compared to the non-living world that's outside. 
Now, uh, what's kind of special in bacteria uh, compared to our cells is that outside of the plasma membrane, they also have a cell wall. And the cell wall offers extra protection uh, for the bacteria against various things. Uh, and depending on the kind of cell wall they have, they might be more resistant to the, um, to the effects of antibiotics, uh, making them a little bit harder to kill. And outside of the cell wall, some bacteria, they have even an additional protection, protectional layer, uh, which is called the capsule. We'll talk more about that in, uh, in a few slides later. Uh, covered, covering the surface of the bacteria are these uh, hair-like structure, which is called a pilus. Um, having a pilus basically allows the bacteria to exchange um, genetic material within other bacteria. It's kind of like uh, some people call it like bacteria sex. Basically, it's the exchange of genetic material between two bacteria, uh, and that actually helps them uh, evolve uh, and, and change its genetic content. Uh, and as you will see, this is a major um, driving force for creating superbugs. Uh, sometimes they have a super long tail called the flagellum, and that just helps them move around the environment. Uh, and on the inside, that's where you will find their DNA, their genetic material. Let's take a closer look at the structure of cell wall. Uh, like I said, depending on the kind of cell wall that the bacteria has, um, that's going to uh, make them more susceptible or less susceptible to antibiotics. Uh, and remember the gram stain we saw earlier, the purple and the pink? Um, so actually, gram-positive bacteria, uh, which shows up as uh, purple on the gram stain, um, those bacteria have a single cell wall outside of the plasma membrane. Okay, So this, this cell wall uh, that you see here, shown in blue, that's made up of a special type of um, uh, sugar protein complex, okay? Uh, and in the case of gram-positive bacteria, there is only just a single uh, peptidoglycan, right? there's the sugar protein complex outside of the plasma membrane. And uh, as such, the cell wall is actually relatively uh, thinner, um, making it easier for the antibiotic to go into the bacteria and killing them. On the other hand, the gram-negative bacteria in addition to the uh, regular cell wall, outside of that, there is another layer of plasma membrane. So the peptidoglycan is actually sandwiched between two layers of plasma membrane. And that um, essentially creates a much thicker barrier, uh, making it more difficult for the antibiotic to go inside the cell. So what that means is if someone is infected, um, by a gram-negative bacteria, uh, regular antibiotics might not be effective in uh, treating the infection, okay? Because they're not going to be able to go into the bacteria, not going to be able to exert its effect. Um, so you might have to prescribe some stronger antibiotics. To make it even more difficult to be killed, some bacteria have evolved to have yet another layer of protection called the capsule. So if you remember the diagram we saw earlier, right, we have the plasma membrane, and then outside of that there is cell wall, and for some bacteria, they would have an additional layer outside of the cell wall, which is called the capsule. Now the capsule, uh, which is shown in this picture, you see all the, the kind of lighter color halo around the bacteria, that, that whole thing is basically the capsule. And, you know, it's much bigger than the bacteria itself, uh, as you can see in the picture. Um, so this capsule allows the bacteria to survive harsh environment, um, such as dehydration, exposure to detergent, right? So even if you try to wash your hands and you happen to have some of these bacteria uh, uh, with capsule on your, on your hands, the detergent might not be able to kill them because of the capsule. Uh, and it helps the bacteria to even invade your immune system. Um, if your white cell try to eat these uh, bacteria with a, with a capsule on them, um, it, it won't be able to do so, okay? So uh, if you have an infection from one of these things, uh, it's going to be a very, very nasty infection, um, and it's going to be very difficult um, to be treated.
We saw in the last two lectures that vaccines are a great way to get protection against viral infections. Now, while vaccines for bacterial diseases do exist, the list is not quite as long as the ones for viruses. Um, here are some common vaccines against bacterial diseases. Uh, and you might remember some of these things are actually on the Ontario vaccination mandate list. Um, things like whopping cough, um, diphtheria, and uh, meningitis. So for the most part, if we do get infected by a bacteria that doesn't have a vaccine available for protecting against it, uh, we will need to have antibiotics um, to, to, to get better from the infection. Um, otherwise, you know, we might get very, very ill. Let's take a look at the discovery of antibiotics. And um, the man who gets the credit for discovering antibiotics is this, this guy. Uh, his name is Alexander Fleming. Here is a famous quote by uh, Fleming. He uh, basically it says, you know, on September 28, 1928, um, he woke up just like any other days uh, and he did not expect on that ordinary day, he would be making the world first discovery uh, uh, of antibiotics. Uh, and that actually would completely revolutionize all medicine. So how did that discovery happen? Well, it's a bit of a funny story, I guess. Uh, Fleming was studying some uh, staphylococci culture. Culture is basically something that scientists use to grow bacteria on. Uh, and here, you know, you can see uh, it's, a, it's a typical culture. Um, so before he went on vacation, as the story goes, Fleming had stacked all his culture of staphylococci um, on the bench in a corner. And he kind of tell his student to take care of it while he uh, is away on vacation. Uh, but when he came back, he was um, not very pleased. He saw that in his uh, staphylococci culture that uh, there has been mold contamination. Right? So the, these little black dots in the, in the center, uh, those are actually mold, moldy contamination. So he was initially very upset uh, uh, at his student. Uh, but later he uh, found out that where the mold has landed in the culture, um, there is a clearing area around the mole okay so that suggested that you know the bacteria don't want to grow near the mole um, and so maybe the mole is creating something that is stopping the bacteria from uh, from growing so long story short after isolating the mole and studying it the mole turns out to be from uh, uh, what's called the uh, penicillium uh, genus, uh, and there are over 300 species in that genus. Um, some of them make penicillin um, that is useful as an antibiotics. And, you know, nowadays, some uh, of the same species of the penicillium uh, genus, they um, actually are used to make cheese. So that's basically how the first antibiotic was discovered, uh, pretty much through luck and chance um, for the most part. In the beginning, uh, isolating the antibiotic produced by the mole was very time consuming. It was expensive and it was labor intensive. Um, the challenge of mass producing the drug was a you know, very daunting task. Um, on March 14, 1942, which was actually you know, 14 years since the Fleming's first discovery of the, uh, of the penicillin, um, the first patient was treated for blood infection with penicillin that was made in the US. Um, just to treat that one patient alone used up half of all the available penicillin at the time. So um, you can see, right, it takes a very long time to, to produce and you are not making up a lot, right? Uh, it's, it wasn't a very effective way uh, uh, to treat people in a large scale. Uh, and, you know, over time, they uh, kind of refine the process and then they partner up with other uh, experts in the field. So by June 1942, um, the U.S. was able to make enough to treat, you know, 10 people now. It's not a huge improvement, but, you know, it's better than using half of your stock on one person, right, I guess. So uh, penicillin helped reduce the number of deaths and, uh, and amputations of, of troops during World War II. Um, and, you know, according to records, there were only 400 million units of penicillin available 
during the first five months of 1943. Uh, uh, but by the time um, the World War II has ended in 1945, um, U.S. companies were making uh, as many as 650 billion units uh, a month. Um, so they really, really perfected the process and kind of ramped up the production. Um, and, you know, it, it has been called a silver bullet. It actually prevented a lot of uh, otherwise would have been a lethal infection in soldiers. Uh, and, you know, uh, as you can see in this in this poster, uh, thanks to penicillin, he uh, will come home as in like the the the. The, the soldiers who are fighting in the wall, right? They are able to come back, right? Because of the uh, of this miracle drug. The cost of penicillin production has gotten a lot cheaper uh, since you know the early days. In 1953, it cost about $300 uh, to make one kilogram. Now, $300 might not seem a lot uh, uh, right now, but you know we're talking about 1953. So if you factor in inflation uh, uh, and stuff like that, um, the $300 would be equivalent to almost $3,000 uh, nowadays. So it takes $3,000 to make uh, uh, one kilogram of penicillin back then. OK, um, so over time, it has gotten a lot, a lot cheaper uh, with advances in biotechnologies, with better understanding uh, in, in organic chemistry, for example. Um, the cost nowadays is just ten dollars per kilogram. OK, it's really, really cheap. Uh, and, you know, you would know, right, it's it's quite an accessible drug. If you get an infection and the doctor uh, prescribes you amoxicillin, right, you don't have to pay a lot for it, right? Uh, and it's such an effective drug that has been used so regularly by so many physicians nowadays that um, uh, there are over three, uh, 33 million pounds of penicillin uh, being produced annually. Uh, and the annual sale market for the sales market for that it's more than 344 million US uh, uh, and you know that's that's quite uh, quite a lot of money so that's basically um, uh, uh, you know how, how it has changed over time now uh, it's important to understand that penicillin is uh, it's not a single drug but a family of, of antibiotics so there are many different types of penicillin uh, on the market um, and you can all, always tell almost always tell um, because they usually end with um, the suffix uh, cillin okay so in uh, amoxicillin for example right and uh, ampicillin okay so they all kind of end with cillin and you would know they are from the penicillin family let's talk about how antibiotics uh, work generally antibiotic can be bactericidal which means it will outright kill the bacteria. Or sometimes it is bacteriostatic, uh, which means it just stops the growth of bacteria, um, essentially slowing their division and buying time for your immune system to clear the bacteria. Different bacteria uh, works differently. Um, uh, uh, different, sorry, different, different antibiotic works differently. Uh, um, pardon me. Different antibiotic works differently, uh, but generally they 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 target something that is unique to the to the bacteria uh, and leave our cells alone. Remember, right? The bacteria, the prokaryotic cells, are quite different than our cells, than the eukaryotic cells. So um, people who come up with these drugs, they they want to target something that is unique in the bacteria uh, and and not our uh, our cells. As I mentioned, penicillin is not a single drug, but a family of antibiotics. So um, they all actually share the same core structure. The name of the core structure is something called the beta lactam ring. Now, I don't want you to get too hung up on the chemistry here right, with all these uh, complicated diagrams. The key thing to note is that um, all of them contains this this structure that is highlighted in red, and that's the beta lactam ring. So here you can see there is the beta lactam, and over here there is the beta lactam. The beta lactam ring is what makes penicillin work. Okay, uh, if you don't have that ring in the structure, you are not going to be able to exert its effect. Okay. Now remember we talked about the bacterial cell wall, the um, special wall that is made of uh, some sugar protein complex called the peptidoglycan. Um, the cell wall is actually not a static structure. 
the bacteria act, uh, will, will constantly tear it down and then rebuild it. Okay, so so they, they will break it down on one side. Uh, uh, they will break it down on one side back to its building blocks, and then they would they would use those building blocks and, and rebuild the wall. Okay, this is called uh, remodeling. Okay, remodeling. Um, the wall. Uh, 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 is important, uh, as you know, for the protection of the bacteria. Uh, and this remodeling just helps helps the bacteria to make sure that the wall is uh, is um, is ha have good integrity uh, and that it's doing its protection job, basically. So what penicillin does is uh, the penicillin is going to interfere interfere with the building process. Okay. Um, so in the presence of penicillin. The bacteria would still break down the wall, okay, into the building blocks, um, but the penicillin will block the rebuilding. So essentially, uh, 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 what happens is the bacteria is um, is is destroying itself by tearing down the wall, and it doesn't have a way to rebuild it, uh, and and that will kill the bacteria. Um, essentially, that's how penicillin works. Since the discovery of penicillin's uh, chemical structure. Um, and, and people uh, have a better understanding of biochemistry and you know how to um, carry out different types of chemical reactions. For example, um, they have been scientists have been trying to modify the penicillin. Okay, so um, by creating variations in the core structures, the beta lactam, um, you are able to create a new classes of penicillin. There are several goals when uh, it comes to trying to create synthetic variants of penicillin. Um, the first goal is to increase what's called the bioavailability of the drug. Bioavailability is basically how much of the drug is able to make it into your bloodstream. Uh, if you have, if, if the drug has a, a bioavailability of 100%, uh, that means uh, uh, all of it is going to end up in your bloodstream. And the only way for that to happen uh, is through um, direct injection into your bloodstream. Okay? But normally, we don't inject our antibiotics. right? Like If you think about the last time you had to take some antibiotics, usually we uh, take it through um, oral means. right? We, you know, we put it in our mouth and we swallow it. So not all of it is going to end up in our bloodstream. You're going to lose some of it uh, uh, in, the, in the digestive process, for example. Uh, sometimes we have uh, 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 antibiotic uh, ointments, right? Uh, that kind of stuff. So not all of it is going to end up in the bloodstream. And I mean, depending on the on the application, uh, 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 sometimes it's okay to have a lower bioavailability. Uh, but generally, you want you want that number to be to be quite high, so the antibiotic can get distributed, right, uh, throughout the body. Um, and so. One of the goals uh, of creating the synthetic variations um, is to increase the bioavailability, uh, and that way um, you are able to take uh, take a lower dose of the of the drug uh, and still achieve the same same uh, results. Another goal for creating synthetic variant is to broaden the spectrum of the antibiotic. A broad spectrum antibiotic can be used to treat a wide range of bacterial infections. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, a narrow spectrum antibiotic is only effective against a few types of bacteria. So in most cases, the broader the spectrum, the more useful the antibiotics will be uh, in, in different scenarios, right? Um, and and, and you, you never really want to create an antibiotic that's only good for one type of infection. Uh, the application of something like that is very, very limited. Uh, and, you know, from, a, from a, a financial perspective, it's also not very cost effective, right? You want to have something that would be uh, good uh, for at least several types of, uh, of infection. Other goals uh, of creating variants include increasing the drug stability so it's not going to be broken down as easily. Uh, and also, we want to reduce the tolerance level. So some bacteria might not be too responsive to, to, to certain types of uh, penicillin. Uh, and, and by modifying the structures of penicillin, um, we can kind of outsmart them okay, and make them uh, make the antibiotic effective again um, against those types of bacteria. 
Even though penicillins are quite useful, but not everyone can take them. Right? Most people have no issues with antibiotics, but some have myoallergic reactions. Uh, and common allergic reactions for people who are allergic to penicillin uh, include things like uh, rash, hives, itchy eyes, you know, and swollen lips. Um, not life-threatening stuff, but still pretty annoying. Okay, um, so if if you're having a mild uh, 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 drug reaction against penicillin, then your doctor might ask you to take some Benadryl, uh, and the symptoms might go away. But uh, for uh, a few rare cases, um, it's possible for people to have life-threatening anaphylactic reactions right, uh, to penicillin, right, uh, or anaphylaxis. Um, we talked about this um, in another lecture earlier in the immune system, I think. Uh, and and when there is a um, anaphylactic shock. Uh, what happens is the person airway is going to constrict. They're going to have a hard time breathing. They might lose consciousness. Um, and you know, if they're not given uh, uh, an EpiPen, for example, a shot of epinephrine, um, then it could potentially be a life-threatening um, scenario for them. Uh, thankfully, there are other types of antibiotics uh, that are not related to penicillin family, uh, and those uh, can be used as alternatives uh, for people with severe penicillin um, allergies. So that that's uh, pretty much the background information on you know bacteria and how antibiotics work uh, to, to kill them. Now we're going to shift focus uh, and talk a little bit about uh, evolution. Okay, so you might be wondering what what does evolution have to do with antibiotics um, and you know in the context of what we are talking about, why do we even bring up evolution? It turns out uh, evolution is uh, quite important uh, uh, when it comes to understanding the relationship between antibiotics and, and bacteria. Now, before we continue, I would like to uh, point out, uh, to clarify something, that um, there is uh, the theory of macro evolution. Okay, so in macroevolution, uh, it deals with the formation of new species. Okay, it talks about where new species come from. Right, uh, and that's not what we are focusing on um, in, uh, in in this course. Uh, we are talking about uh, microevolution. Okay, so microevolution uh, is something that is happening uh, all the time in bacteria, uh, and that is what's driving them to become so-called superbugs. Okay, we'll talk more about superbugs later. But in case you're wondering, superbugs are basically bacteria that uh, cannot be killed by uh, by many many antibiotics. Okay, um, uh, uh, a whole group of antibiotics would have no effect on these superbugs, so they're really really hard to kill, uh, and um, there is virtually no way to treat them. Um, so, how do these superbugs? become so strong and where do they come from? Well, to understand that, we need to understand the theory of evolution first. Let's start with some basic molecular biology uh, that will help us understand evolution. First, the hereditary material that we pass on from one generation to the next generation is called DNA. So basically, DNA uh, is so-called the blueprint of life. That's what makes us who we are uh, and when we have kids right the the mother would pass on half the genetic material through the eggs and the father would pass on half the genetic material through um, the sperm uh, and that would create the, the, the child basically so um, dna exists in the form of chromosome in our cells uh, and in humans there are 23 pairs of chromosomes uh, in each of our cells uh, and as I mentioned, half of these uh, would come from uh, a mom and half of it would come from dad. And you can see they are all lined up in this picture um, that is called a karyotype. Okay, so a karyotype is essentially an orderly arrangement of all the chromosomes, typically based on size. So uh, you have chromosome 1 that is the longest and all the way to chromosome 22. Uh, and then you have a, a special pair uh, that makes up your uh, 23rd pair of chromosome uh, and this would be the sex chromosome uh, and the sex chromosome as the name implies is going to determine the sex of the person the gender of the person so for male it is xy and for female it is xx now your dna which is the stuff that makes up your chromosome 
uh, is actually only made up of four alphabets, okay? Uh, A, C, G, and T, okay? So your entire genetic makeup are basically billions and billions of these A, C, T, and G uh, uh, arranged in a specific order, okay? Uh, and, and that is essentially our genetic material. So, of course, the genetic material is not unique to humans. Uh, bacteria, they have their own genetic material. It's going to be in a different order than humans, of course, but it's the same A, G, C, T, okay? Um, you know, cats, they have it. Plants, they have it. Basically, everything that's alive, uh, they have genetic material. And the building blocks are always uh, the DNA, which is made up of A, C, G, and T. The genome... The genome of an organism is all of its genetic information. So all 23 pairs of chromosomes, all, uh, all um, 46 uh, chromosomes considered together uh, would be the genome of the person. So if you take one chromosome, for example, here's one chromosome. On the chromosome, there are multiple genes. So there might be a gene here, a gene here, a gene here, a gene, 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 gene. So there are thousands and thousands of genes that are present on each chromosome. Uh, and a gene is essentially a segment on the chromosome. And this segment contains the, uh, the genetic code, the special instruction that would create a specific uh, a trait in the person. Okay, so here we might have a gene that's going to give you like brown eyes or something, brown eyes. Okay, so you might have another gene down here that's going to determine your blood type. Okay, so everything about you, uh, the way you look, uh, your, uh, um, the way that uh, uh, your body is, um, is the way it is, uh, for the most part, uh, is dictated by what is in your gene. Okay. When a cell divides, uh, all of its genetic materials are going to be copied and passed on, creating two exact copies of itself. Um, so here you can see there is one normal cell, and then afterwards you it's going to divide and become two cells. And these two cells are exactly the same, contains the exact genetic material as the original. The accurate duplication of the entire genome uh, is actually very important because you want to ensure all the cells are identical to the original. And if it's not, then sometimes it could mean um, trouble. And what is the trouble? Well, copying all the DNA, all the genetic material is actually uh, quite, a, quite a difficult task. Okay? It's no small fleet. There are three billions of those A, C, G, and T that needs to be copied every time we want to uh, uh, divide our cell. Uh, and the speed at which it happens at is quite fast. Your body is able to copy 50 letters per second. Okay. Now, even though there are spell checking mechanisms in place, making sure that there are no errors, um, because we are doing it so fast and with so many base to copy, uh, so many letters to copy, uh, it is possible to make mistakes sometimes. And if the mistakes are not corrected, uh, then that leads to a permanent change in your DNA. Uh, and, and that is basically what we call uh, a mutation. Okay. And if a mutation occurs in the cell, all the descendants of the mutated cell will contain that same mutation. So think about, you know, you're taking notes in class and then your friend wants to copy your notes. But then when the, your friend copied the notes, uh, uh, she made a mistake. OK, uh, and then now another friend asks her if she can borrow uh, 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 the notes to copy. So because that that copy of the notes has has an error in it, everybody who copies from that will essentially have the same error uh, from that point on. So in the same way, if I have a normal cell that's dividing, okay, uh, these two are exactly the same as that one. Uh, but then during this process, a mistake happens. So this is uh, where the mutation happens. There is the mistake. And, and afterwards, the cell becomes like a different cell. Uh, and then all of the cells after that is going to carry the same mistake. 
Okay, and you know you can take a look here. This this one actually looks different uh, from this one. So maybe there is another mutation here. So uh, 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 that's basically what, what what like a skin mole is, right? Like if you if you have a mole on your skin, like a like a black dot uh, that's growing on the skin, uh, that essentially is a mutation that occur uh, some time ago. And and at the beginning there was only one cell that has that mutation, but that cell keeps on dividing and dividing. Um, and and eventually uh, it creates a, a big spot, right? And and every cell in that mole contains the same mutation uh, uh, that happened long time ago, and and that causes it to be different than the rest of the skin cells, uh, which does not have the mutation. So there are three possible effects of mutation. Um, the best case scenario. For most, for the most part, is to have a neutral mutation. In a neutral mutation, um, there are no apparent effects on the organism. You don't, you wouldn't even know you had the mutation. Okay, uh, there's a change in genetical, uh, but it doesn't result in any uh, any effect at all. And that's possible um, because um, of like a fail safe uh, in your DNA code, uh, which we're not going to go into um, at this moment. Uh, it could be a beneficial mutation. Um, that's rare, but it does happen. Uh, and, and that's actually something that drives evolution. If there is a mutation that caused the organism to have some kind of survival or reproductive advantage, then um, uh, that will result in an increase um, a chance of that trait of that uh, 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 gene being passed on in future generations. Uh, so more of the individuals uh, will will have that beneficial mutation. More on that later. Uh, and the last possible outcome is is the is the usual outcome of a mutation. Okay, the the one that nobody wants, but it's the one that is the likely outcome. Uh, and that is a deleterious uh, uh, effect. Okay, so this will reduce the survival chance of the individual or the reproductive advantage, uh, and uh, it's going to have a negative impact on uh, on the organism. So cancer, for example, uh, would be would be a deleterious mutation. Now that we have an understanding of basic concepts of DNA, let's take a look at evolution. There have been many theories about evolution, uh, and you know some of uh, some of them are, are uh, incorrect, uh, while some are correct. Uh, and one of the most uh, more famous ones, I, I guess, uh, was from uh, this person named Jean Baptiste Lamarck. Okay, so the theory of evolution for Lamarck goes something like this. Um, he theorized that you know for giraffes um, long time ago. Uh, the giraffes they used to have shorter necks, okay. Uh, and what happens is because they want to reach for the food that is uh, high up in the tree, so they stretch their neck a little bit, okay. Uh, and then the neck got a little bit longer. And then um, next generation, uh, they would stretch the neck a little bit further and further and further and further until over time, uh, over many 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 generations. Um, the giraffe eventually has a very, very long neck. Okay, so that's the uh, idea of uh, evolution according to Lamarck. Uh, but there was a major flaw in this theory, uh, and that is acquired traits are not inheritable. So acquired traits are traits that you uh, uh, gain uh, throughout your lifetime. Okay, um, so uh, for example, if you have if you dye your hair blue your babies are not going to be born with blue hair, right? Uh, and if you work out a lot and, and you are very, very muscular and strong, your baby's not going to be born with the same physique uh, as you. Uh, uh, they're not going to be born, you know, with a lot of muscles, right? Um, and that's why, that's why the theory uh, of evolution uh, from Lamarck was not correct. Even though, even though if the giraffe did stretch their necks, uh, it doesn't matter because it won't be passed on to the next generation. Okay, um, acquired traits is not something that can be passed on. So uh, there is the theory of evolution by Charles Darwin, and that is uh, the accepted model for explaining evolution. In his theory, the main driver of evolution is a concept called natural selection. Okay, natural selection. 
Natural selection is based on several key premises. Okay? First, uh, for natural selection to work, individuals within population is going to vary from one another. Okay? So this is not difficult to understand. Right? If you look at the human population, um, everybody looks different. Okay? There are different eye colors, different hair color, different skin color, uh, uh, different blood types, um, and all these are considered as variations within the population. Now, uh, if you look at zebras, for example, like they might they might all look the same to us, but uh, I guarantee you there are just as much variations between the zebras uh, as there are variations between the human population. So for most species, uh, variations do exist. The only time variation is limited is um, if the uh, uh, if the organism uh, grows by cloning. Okay, so plants, for example. Um, all the plants in a, in a, in a field uh, could have very similar genetic makeup um, if they all uh, uh, are growing by by cloning. And, and some plants they they do grow by cloning. Uh, you know, if you if you ever have those spider plants, for example, you can break off a piece and give it to your friend, and then they could grow an entire new plant uh, uh, from that. Uh, and that's an example of cloning. But for the most part, um, uh, uh, animal populations and certainly uh, uh, humans, there are a lot of variations that exist within the population. Another premise uh, for natural selection to work is uh, some of those variations that you observe in the population are going to be inheritable, meaning they can be passed on to the next generation. Um, there are some genetic components to it, um, so that's why you can pass it on. Right? Remember how you look uh, uh, and, and the traits that you have are basically as a result of the uh, of our DNA, of the genes in our DNA, uh, and DNA is what's being passed on uh, uh, to the next generation when we when we have babies. So some of these variations will give advantage to survival uh, and or reproduction. For example, if you look at the long beak of a hummingbird over here, right? Um, the hummingbird having the long beak is uh, is a survival advantage because it will allow them to gain easy access to the nectar uh, compared to birds with shorter beak. Okay, so um, uh, the birds with longer beak are going to be able to get more food uh, and possibly live longer compared to those with um, with much shorter beak. Uh, the tail of a peacock, which is actually called the train of the peacock, uh, they actually comes in different sizes, uh, and 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 the uh, uh, and the fan that the train uh, uh, is on male, uh, and and it's used to attract a mate. Um, so scientists have actually found that uh, the longer the train uh, on the male peacock. Uh, the uh, easier it is for them to attract a mate. So there, by having a longer train, there is a reproductive advantage. Uh, however, if the train is too long, uh, it might be easy for them to attract a mate, but then it would make it very difficult to get away from predators. Okay, uh, And so it becomes a liability if it's way too long. Um, so something that has a, a, a reproductive advantage might have a survival trade-off. Uh, and ultimately, it's it's a balance point, right? Uh, and um, those are the two examples of how uh, various traits can give rise to either survival or reproductive advantage. So to put it together, natural selection basically means that favorable uh, variations in a population that can be passed on uh, will increase over time in a population because by increasing the survival of individuals that have that trait or increasing the reproductive success of individuals who have that trait would guarantee uh, that they have more offspring. Uh, and uh, that is going to cause future generations to possess the same trait. And the opposite is, always tr is also true. If there is an unfavorable variation, uh, those tend to be lost in the population over time. So with these two mechanisms uh, going on uh, uh, over uh, many, many generations, the population will become more adapted to the environment because uh, only favorable traits uh, will, um, will be uh, uh, passed on uh, uh, in, in that population. 
It is important to understand natural selection is not a matter of choice or will of the organism. It's just uh, simply an underlying force of nature. Okay? The process does not create new variation. The variation must already exist within the population in order for it to be selected okay? uh, or be selected against. So back to our giraffe uh, uh, example. Okay? Uh, so in the giraffe population, um, there will be variation. You will have some giraffes that has a uh, longer neck compared to those that has shorter neck. Okay, and if there is a competition uh, uh, with limited food source, um, then the giraffes with the slightly longer neck is going to have an advantage, uh, and so they would be able to reach uh, to a higher place and get more food. Uh, and they in turn have more. Uh, 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 offsprings, more babies, right? Uh, and those babies are going to inherit that longer neck feature, okay? So over many, many, many generations, um, that's how the giraffes end up having a very long neck. So that that has to be uh, within the population already um, and, and not something that just kind of, you know, uh, 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 be created out of the blue. Um, so you can see in this uh, in this comic, the, the beaver is trying to chew on the tree and then it gets really, really tired from chewing. So it, it's trying to, uh, to concentrate really, really, really hard and try to evolve a chainsaw arm uh, uh, from, from, from thinking really hard. Uh, and you know, that, that kind of sounds ridiculous, right? Uh, well, because it, it is, it is ridiculous. Um, you can change uh, 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 your own feature and evolve that way. Okay, it's a good way to remember um, that individuals do not evolve within a population. Uh, 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 like we as a person, we cannot evolve. Okay, it's only the population that is going to evolve, and it's going to take time before the evolution is um, is obvious. There are uh, several patterns uh, of natural selection. Um, so let's say we have a type of moth where the population has various shades ranging from, uh, from white to black with some different shades of grades in between. Um, and in one of the patterns uh, is what we call the directional selection, okay, which shifts the range variation in, uh, of the tray in one direction. So uh, if uh, we have a directional selection pattern, then over time uh, we will shift either towards the, the black color moth or the white color moth. In the stabilizing selection pattern, uh, what happens is over time you will lose the extreme uh, form of the variation and you will stabilize in the intermediate form. So in our example, you will lose the white and the black uh, and the population of moth would consist of mostly uh, gray uh, shade uh, moths. And finally, the last pattern is what's called the disruptive selection uh, pattern. Uh, and in this pattern, it will favor the extremes of the variation. Um, so you will lose everything in, in the middle and the population would exist as either uh, white or black. So our hypothetical moth actually uh, do exist in real life. Uh, they are called the peppered moth. Uh, and you can see in this picture, they exist as, as white or, or uh, black, as well as a, a grayish color uh, in, in between, okay? So um, the color here is the variation uh, that exists within the population. And it's something that can be passed on. Um, so definitely this means that natural selection is going to be able to, um, to, uh, to, to act on, to select on this uh, tray. Uh, and you can see that some of the moths are blending in a little bit better uh, with the environment uh, than others. It depends on the color of the tree bark that they're on. Um, so on, on this kind of grayish, uh, white, grayish uh, background, then it's good to be a gray moth. If it's a, a darker um, tree bark, then it's better to be a, a darker color uh, moth. So uh, before the Industrial Revolution, um, there were actually more light colored pepper moths because they are better camouflaged against a clean tree bark, uh, which is lighter in color. Um, and the dark ones would stand out uh, uh, when they are resting on the tree bark and therefore they get eaten uh, uh, more more easily by, by birds and whatnot. Uh, 
So uh, in other words, the light color pepper moth had a survival advantage uh, and they can live on longer than the dark color moth and have more offspring. Um, so the majority of the population are going to be consist of the white uh, colored pepper moth. Um, and then after the Industrial Revolution, or, or I should say when the Industrial Revolution occurred, um, there was a lot of pollution, you know, from, from the burning of the fossil fuel. Uh, and, and the soot uh, is now covering the, uh, the tree bark, causing the tree bark to become a lot darker. And all of a sudden, the dark color pepper moth is having an advantage. Right? They don't stand out as much on the polluted tree bark anymore. So now the white ones are being eaten uh, more often by the birds. And so over time, the dark ones are now going to be able to have more offspring. And over several, uh, many generations, um, the pepper moth population uh, now has more of the dark ones uh, compared to the lighter ones. So this would be an example of uh, a, a directional selection uh, uh, shift by, uh, by natural selection. Another thing to remember is that natural selection caused the organism to become better fit to their environment, but not necessarily better overall. Uh, what's better for one situation might not be better for another, as we saw with the moth, right? Um, it might be good to be a lighter color moth when there is no pollution, okay? But as soon as the environment changes, um, then all of a sudden that trait is no longer a desirable trait. So natural selection has no uh, no purpose. It has no direct, no, no, um, it, some people think, you know, evolution is always going to uh, uh, create the ultimate version, the best version of that organism, but it's not true. Okay. Uh, as soon as the environment changes, then, um, uh, then, you know, the traits are going to be reselected, uh, by that new environment. And, uh, uh, as long as the environment is not static, um, it's still possible for natural selection to, uh, to keep on occurring. Similar to natural selection is something called artificial selection. The main difference between artificial and natural selection is that uh, while natural selection is a natural phenomenon that occurs you know, without an, any uh, 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 interfering, interference from humans, um, artificial selections are deliberate action by human choice. Um, almost all the crops and domesticated animals are as a result of uh, artificial selection. Take tomatoes, for example. There are so many different types of tomatoes out there. Cherry tomatoes, Roma tomatoes, and, you know, that's all the names I know. But there are so many other uh, different types of tomatoes out there. So how do we get the big, juicy red uh, uh, tomatoes? Well, the uh, tomato uh, uh, farmers, um, they would choose the biggest tomatoes uh, 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 and the reddest tomatoes uh, from each uh, from each generation, um, they would choose the top 10%, for example, the, the top 10% that is the biggest, the reddest, uh, and then they would breed the next generation from those plants. Uh, and if they keep on choosing the top 10% uh, every every generation, then over time, you will end up having a tomato that's, that's big and red, much bigger and much redder compared to, say, you know, 10, 20 generations ago. Uh, and similarly, if you're trying to get the cherry tomato, you would do the opposite, right? Uh, uh, and so that creates all the different breeds of, of uh, tomato, uh, tomatoes out there. And it's uh, uh, similar to, to dogs. It turns out all the dogs have a common ancestor, the great wolf. Uh, and depending on what trait is being uh, uh, selected for, then we end up having all the different types of uh, dogs that we see uh, uh, today. So uh, I don't really know the names of the dogs, but you know, if, if you have one of these big furry dogs, um, then that probably came from uh, specifically selecting for dogs with long fluffy fur, and then you breed them, and over many, many generations, you end up with the uh, extra fluffy uh, dog that you see uh, right here, right here. Okay, um, and you know if you have the dogs that had the really really uh, short legs, right? Then again, that's the trait that is being selected for. Um, so artificial selection is it works in the exact same way as natural selection. The only difference is that uh, uh, human beings are making the decision of what trait to to choose, what trait to select for. 
So let's talk about uh, how genetic materials are transferred from one bacteria to another, and then we will tie it all in with the evolution uh, uh, in the next lecture. So here we, we see there is one bacteria here, uh, and it doesn't have those um, uh, uh, hairy things sticking out of it. Uh, and having those hairy things are actually good for the bacteria because they are going to uh, give it um, the ability to stick to each other. Uh, and when a lot of bacteria stick together, they form what's called biofilm, uh, making it very difficult to kill them. So uh, um, this bacteria with, the, with those uh, hairy things is trying to pass the genetic material to this one over here so that this one can too make those hairy things. And in order for them to do it, um, that's what this, this thing is. This is the pillus, if you remember. Okay, that's the thing that allows the bacteria to exchange genetic material. So after passing on the uh, uh, genetic material, the DNA that is required to make the um, the, the hairy stuff um, to this bacteria, uh, it would cause it to, to change and be able to make that as well. So um, that's an example of how genetic material is being transferred. So what I just described on the previous slide uh, involves creating new genetic variation within the bacterial population. But for the most part, bacteria, if, if, if you, just, you have just one single bacterium uh, and, and, and it's trying to reproduce, then they actually do what's called asexual reproduction. Okay? So unlike um, humans, for example, humans do sexual reproduction. It requires a, a male and a female uh, and, and you know, uh, the sperm and the egg has to come together to create the offspring. But for uh, bacteria, um, they do asexual reproduction. Only one bacterium is, is necessary for this process to occur. Um, and then they would, they would basically um, uh, split in two uh, and um, they would have the exact genetic uh, components. So this process is called binary uh, fission. Okay, uh, and depending on the type of bacteria you're talking about, uh, they could divide uh, in as little as 12 minutes uh, uh, per division uh, under optimal condition, or sometimes it takes more than 24 hours. In addition to the uh, core DNA in the bacteria, they also have these circular DNAs, uh, which are called uh, plasmids. Okay, and the plasmid contains a few uh, genes on them, um, and these extra uh, genes on the on the plasma is actually uh, what gives the bacteria more genetic diversity. Uh, and typically speaking, those plasmid are going to give the bacteria some kind of survival and reproductive advantage under a given condition. Right? So when you saw the two bacteria coming together and exchanging uh, genetic material, they are actually exchanging their plasmid. Okay? Uh, and, and that will make both bacteria a little bit uh, better adapt to the environment. So let's go through this again. Let's say we have this bacterium and it has a blue plasmid and the blue plasmid makes it resistant resistant to antibiotic, antibiotic A. And then we have another bacteria, uh, and this one is going to have uh, a red plasma that makes it resistant to antibiotic B. Okay, and what happens is these two bacteria found each other, um, and then this one is gonna extend the pillars and connect to this one, okay? And this uh, process is called conjugation. Okay, and what happens is this blue bacteria can clone the blue plasma and then through the pillars it's going to give it to the red bacteria and the red bacteria can clone the red plasma and then give it to the blue bacteria. And after the conjugation process is completed, now both, uh, both bacteria will now be both resistant to antibiotic A and antibiotic B. So if you think about this one, uh, now go find another bacteria, and this one has a plasmid that makes it resistant to uh, antibiotic C, and then they do conjugation, right? Afterwards, then this one would be resistant to three antibiotics, and so will this one. And in this manner, you can see very quickly, a bacteria can acquire many, many, many plasmids through conjugation, uh, and ultimately creating 
uh, a super buck, something that is um, going to be resistant to multiple, multiple antibiotics. The good news is uh, it's hard for them to find each other because bacteria are so small. Uh, uh, but uh, we will learn in the in the next lecture that um, through antibiotic um, uh, misuse, uh, we are actually creating the condition, the perfect conditions for these superbugs to to evolve. Uh, and you know, with these emergence of superbugs, uh, it actually uh, makes it very difficult uh, for us to treat and um, to treat bacterial infections with antibiotics. Uh, and and you know, if antibiotics no longer works, um, then a lot of people are going to uh, to die from simple infections, uh, and um, that could you know significantly shorten the life expectancy uh, of uh, of humans again. So there you have it. That's the uh, antibiotics and evolution, uh, and we're gonna uh, uh, talk more about the superbug uh, and some ethical concerns uh, in our next lecture. So thank you for watching. I'll see you next week.